And we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Stephen. Hey, so today we are back with another mini-sode focused on a single trending plant that we are excited about right now. We are talking about a plant that I kind of feel like Stephen has thought is not very interesting and has kind of been passing over, but it happens to be my favorite trailing succulent. Hey, today we're talking about Serapegia woodii. Yeah, it is also known as the String of Hearts, and it has like a ton of other monikers that it goes by. Some of these are pretty amusing, like... Uh, like tangle of hearts, I think, but it's also called hearts on a string, sweetheart vine, rosary vine, color of hearts, chain of hearts. Wow. Okay. I've heard a couple of these, but rosary yeah. vine. Wow. Yeah. This is the trailing succulent to round out that popular group of Senecio uh, that include like the string of pearls, the string of dolphins, the string of bananas. This is kind of their little companion plant for most gardeners. And to me, it's the best. All right, so um, why is it interesting? Well, I think that part of the reason that people are gravitating towards this is that it has some of the most interesting foliage of the trailing succulents. So while the other ones that I just mentioned have like thick, fleshy, like truly succulent looking foliage and leaves, like you're not gonna mistake them, for a non-succulent plant. I think that this one with its thinner kind of, you know, kidney bean or heart-shaped leaves, mm -hmm. they have a little bit more interesting patterns. They can be light green, dark green. They, they might have silvery veining. There are plenty of variegated varieties that have shades of pink and cream. They're are like actually quite a few specific cultivars of it that offer little variations on the standard green and silver form. Mm -hmm. And I just think that this is one of the more visually appealing of these plants for that reason. And then I think one of the other key things that makes this a particularly interesting plant are its flowers. They are so strange looking. In fact, the genus itself is named um, after Greek for wax fountain because it kind of has like this like vase shape and they look a little waxy. Wax fountain. Okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'd be more interested if they were called like wax fountains. That's just like, what? Well, they are closely <laughs> related to the Hoyas. These are members of the milkweed subfamily of Aponaceae. So... You will definitely, if you kind of like put your botany glasses on, you might see some similarities in the flower structures compared with other members of the milkweed subfamily. Um, but it's a unique and interesting little touch that you will probably see on your string of hearts if you are caring for it nicely. All right, awesome. So when did you start growing this plant? I think I've seen this around your place for the last year or two at least. Yeah, so I... I really was not that into this plant when I first started seeing it around because what you'll typically find is a nursery that has like just a ton of random little succulents in like little nursery pots and string of pearls is like this too but it'll look like a little mess on top of the soil of some scraggly wiry little vines some leaves that might look pretty rough from shipping and from just being handled and to me it was always like you know, I've seen beautiful pictures of these online. This is not a beautiful plant that I'm looking at in person. So I passed up on them for quite a while. And then one day I just decided, you know, I like what they look like when they're mature and beautifully grown enough that I do need to get my hands on one of these. And this was right around the time that I think every other person who collects plants had that same thought because they were hard to get your hand on for a little while. I wasn't finding them available at Home Depot or random garden centers the way that I had seen them available in years prior. And so the prices started going up. And of all of the local Seattle nurseries, the only one that I could find that carried it was actually Sky Nursery, like way up in Shoreline. So 
I didn't buy those plants from Sky Nursery because they were looking kind of sad, but I did go to a wholesaler with Miles, and they happened to have a shipment of them that had just come in, and I specifically told Miles, like, I need to have this plant, so the next time that you find it available, make sure that you get at least one of them for me. So he just invited me with him to go to the wholesaler, and I picked out some that I thought would look good for his shop, and I kept the nicest one for myself because I'm selfish, but... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but that plant didn't last long for me, and this was because I was growing it under fairly bright light, and I was watering it when the top of the soil looked dry, and that rotted it. Okay, so how have you been growing this plant? Well, I killed two or three in between that first one and the one that I have right now, okay. and each of these was because I was watering it too regularly. This is some realness, like some plant daddy humility that I think is important. Yeah, right? like, like we don't stick every landing the first time. So I am not afraid to admit how many plants I have killed because to me, every plant that I kill hopefully offers me a learning opportunity, and that ideally the next time that I try, I'll either be successful or less unsuccessful. <laughs> yeah. hey, that's something yeah so this one i think of it as a succulent so succulent conditions i or what sort of okay. like what what was doing my original plants in like those first three or four that i abused to death with generous watering um i was watering them kind of the way that i would my uh sedum morganianum the the, the burrow's tail mm -hmm. which yeah yeah, I would peg that as my second favorite trailing succulent. But I water that one pretty liberally in the summer. Like, it's in a clay pot, so if I soak it, wait until the top looks dry, continue to water it, I've never had any issues of rotting. The plant is thriving. It's doing really, really well for me. So I kind of figured, well, this is a trailing succulent. It's probably going to want something similar. But it was way too much water. So what I did when I got my most recent one, which I've had for well over a year now, I barely water it. Like, I'll give it sips every now and then, but I honestly probably water that plant less than most of my other ones. Okay, so maybe, broadly speaking, like cacti level of water? Yeah, it? wow. yeah, it's, it's pretty cactus-like in its water needs. Huh. The way that they grow is from tubers underground, and these are... Um, at least on the size plants that I have, they're fairly small. They're like the size of beans and they store water for the plant. So it doesn't need that much. And because mm. they have such like kind of waxy leaves, they don't really lose a lot to transpiration. They enjoy humidity, but they don't require it. So I've just been growing it as a basic house plant. And as soon as I kind of learned that you just kind of water them when you know that it's bone dry and the leaves even begin to shrivel a little bit. If you give it water at that point, you're fine. Okay, so it sounds like the biggest danger would be overwatering. Like, yep. you know, we hear so often, underwater yeah. before you would overwater. Yeah, when I was doing research for this episode, every single source that I found that was reputable and worth reading mm -hmm. basically talked about how these are very easy like basically indestructible house plants and that the one challenge the people have is watering because okay. if you think that the plant needs water it probably doesn't if the plant looks like it needs water you might think to water it um but they're really flexible on their light needs so i feel like as far as succulents go and especially trailing ones this one is really pretty bulletproof okay. as long as you let it dry all right, let it dry. Doesn't need to be right under lights or in your brightest window. It can yeah. kind of be toward the back. It should be toward the back. It sounds like. It should yeah. Not be. I think that they are fine in very bright light. In mm -hmm. fact, direct sun in kind of northern latitudes or far southern latitudes might be just fine. But they do tend to burn. The leaves are fairly delicate, mm -hmm. um, and. The nice thing about these that I found is that I have grown uh, the one that I have uh, been really happy with on the same shelf that I'm growing my satin pothos and some maranta plants and it's nearby some sansevieria. So anybody who's kind of listened to me talking about my various plants, this happens to be one of my very lowest light corners. It's adjacent to a sliding glass door onto an east-facing balcony, but it doesn't get nearly 
like any direct sunlight Mm -hmm. and all the light that it gets has been fairly ambient and yet that didn't stop the plant it grew to about like five feet long trailing off the shelf five feet yeah like it was almost at the point that the rabbits could reach it from the floor wow yeah like i i must have missed this i thought it was you had like six inches it was a fairly delicate little plant that was tucked on the shelf in my dining room so it was fairly easy to miss unless you were looking for it see yeah uh listeners i think he may be lying um right i'm not gonna tell you if i'm lying or not (laughs) i'm joking no but but it five foot plant i didn't see well the shelf that it was on was above kind of our head level and it trailed down to like knee level yeah and you know okay and it did all of this growth in no direct sunlight and I'm thinking now, I did see a huge bunch of cuttings at some point, and I'm like, where did you get that much of it? Well, I chopped That's, the whole plant up. It's coming together for me now? Okay. Yeah. Any other challenges you say? Well, I think that there are a couple of things that people complain about online. One of them is that they look sparse over time. And that's because each tuber might produce a couple of shoots, and those shoots themselves might branch, But if you have a really long grown plant, like the one that I have, Mm -hmm. it might begin to lose some of those older leaves. And then that means that the wiry, thin stems then are just thin, wiry stems. So it's not going to look bushy and full like you want it to. Yeah. And I think that when people get most nursery pots, they're going to run into that where there's kind of this like length uh, quotient that Mm -hmm. helps the plant look great. When it's shorter than that, it doesn't yeah. look amazing. When it's longer than that, it kind of declines how it looks. So I think that ultimately, that's just a process of plant maintenance that mm-hmm. you can overcome pretty easily. Yeah. So maybe trimming and you know starting. Yeah. New the really that. nice thing about these is that they are extremely easy to propagate, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you ever have a lanky looking plant. Just chop it up into propagation material and start over. They're fast growing. They're reliable uh, as as cuttings. So I think that this is a really easy thing to get around if you just know how to treat the plant. Okay. I think that another complaint that I've heard is that people find that the internode length between leaf sets can be maybe a little bit long. And so again, kind of that sparse look, even down the vine. Yeah. Now, there's maybe a couple of things that I will say about this. If you really care about that, this isn't really the plant for you because it does grow like three inch internodes between little paired leaves. So that is the nature of the plant. If you only have one or two vines on your plant, you're really going to notice that short internode length. But if you have like a bunch of little Uh, baby plants collected in a pot as they grow longer the individual leaves on individual vines will disguise how long the internodes actually are so yeah like that's that's a good reason to propagate but if you do care specifically about how long the stem is between those leaves just grow something like hoya curtsii because it's a similar look, but the internodes are much shorter. So yeah, I would totally agree. Yeah, yeah. like that's this is the nature and, of the plant. And listen, that Hoya, right? The care will be pretty different. I think it's a different ask, right, of the yeah. grower. But yeah, if you're serious about that look, maybe look into those other things. Yeah. Now, something that Stephen has pointed out is that they get really tangled in shipment. Um, yeah, I've definitely seen that online. People talk about how they detangle. Like it's so it's such a topic of discussion that they're like, okay, here's exactly what I did, right? Um, so yeah, anything that you would suggest there, just be careful. I would suggest being careful and also know that because one of the common names of this plant is like, um, I don't have it in front of me, but it's like Tangle of Hearts. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. that is like a really apt description because imagine you have really thin wiry vines mm-hmm. that every three inches they have two heart shaped leaves. I'm sure that you can imagine how easily like you would rip leaves off because one vine gets caught inside of another leaf and then it pulls and then those leaves are all caught up. So if you really care about this, which I happen to be a grower who does, I really, really thoughtfully kind of arrange the vines so that they are distributed around like the edge of the pot. Um, And then I just kind of untangle each of them gently 
you have to be very careful because you will rip leaves off if you're rough with it. But if you rip leaves off and are all upset because you now have a sparser looking plant, again, you can fix this and the plant will regrow. So be very gentle with them. It's less of an issue than like with the burrow's tail sedum that if you just look at it wrong, tons of little leaflets fall off everywhere. Yeah. This is not going to happen, but you can rip the leaves off if you're rough with it. All right. So why do we think this is trending? I would just say, right? I mean, it's hearts. It's a succulent. It's a different f- profile. You have a vining plant. I yeah. think, you know, people like that in their mix. There's also you, like a variegated version as well as just the straight mm-hmm. species has patterned leaves. I think that it checks a lot of boxes for things that people look for in their plants right now. I think it's very beautiful. I think it's very easy to grow. And just the fact that it can tolerate a really wide range of light is amazing to me. One of the things that I was reading online is that the leaf color itself will change to kind of indicate what its light exposure is. A lot of places uh, report that Low light will produce pale green leaves, whereas bright light will produce dark green leaves. Mm -hmm. The variegation is going to appear different depending on its light exposure. You'll probably get more pink and brighter light. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a feature for me. Yeah. And I, I don't even look at that as like, oh, I have pale green leaves. I really have to increase the light so they get dark. I would look at that as, wow, look, I've got this plant that has all these different colored leaves just based on where I put it in my home because Mm -hmm. none of them are unattractive. I think objectively, they're all nice. Yeah, so is this plant here to stay? I don't really have a sense, honestly, of how long it's been kind of A long time, actually. Really? Because I just feel like two years ago or so, I think around the same time as you, I I was sort of like seeing this around. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, is this something I'm going to look for? And then I kind of like didn't. We can get into that, but... yeah. But yeah, is it how long was it around? Or well, it was discovered in I want to say like 1883 or something. So <laughs> like yeah. it's from the Victorian era or almost the Edwardian period. So it was in homes then. No, the first samples of it were sent from like the the portions of Africa where it's native to Kew Garden in like 1893. And when they got it to bloom for the first time, they were pretty amazed at how easy it is to grow and propagate. So it began entering homes probably like in the early 1900s. Okay, so that's a while. Yeah, this is actually a plant that's been around. I think it might be a plant that is slightly less known. Like it's not as popular when you think of like classic vintage plants. You think of like parlor palms and snake plant and monstera. Mm -hmm. This is not one of those. It's really enjoying a surge of popularity now because of kind of the the cute marketing that you can have with something called String of Hearts and all the other mentions. Yeah, people are interested in heart-shaped things, right? We have a lot of heart-shaped little plants. Yeah. Um, And I I, I do want to point out that quite a few of the cultivars of this have much more like kidney shaped. Like instead of being like pointed on the ends, they're round. I personally Mm -hmm. like those, but it's the same plant. I think that this is definitely one, though, that's going to remain around. All right. So it's really available now, right? Yeah. And you said it's easy to propagate. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So here's the cool thing about this plant. This is a tuber-forming species of the Serapegia genus. And because of this, uh, you obviously have a tuber underground that will sprout new growth if you happen to clip off the above uh, vines. So those vines above do two really great things. One is that they root very easily. And so you can just cut little like six inch sections of vines, strip the lower leaves, tuck them all in a shot glass together like I've done. And with some water in a couple of weeks, you'll have a lot of roots. And then you can pot those up and they'll be thoroughly happy. They'll continue growing and put out new growth at an alarming rate. I'm actually surprised at how much growth I have seen on the cuttings that are just in a shot glass (laughs) in my kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now, the other neat thing that they do, in addition to growing roots from the stem easily, is that they actually produce little swollen nodes that are beginnings of tubers. Okay. So if those touch down on soil, they will also begin to grow. But instead of it being like kind of an anchoring mechanism, it'll actually just want to produce another plant. So that's a really great propagation method that the plant has built into itself so when you happen to see that your your vine especially after it's done blooming when it has some sparse looking foliage take a look at the stems and if you see swollen nodes that are kind of small like a very tiny little pea but they're pale kind of a light brownish to white creamy color 
Uh, you can cut those off. And okay. like the the stem portion, you can cut that off, bury it so that the tuber is just under the soil level, and you got a new plant like waiting to happen. A lot of people recommend actually like putting a pot, like an empty pot of soil beside your plant and then pinning these down uh, so that they can grow roots into the soil while it's still attached to the mother plant. Hmm. I don't think this is necessary. I think it's probably like the best practice, but ultimately like it's a really great way to do this. So when my mother plant was starting to get lanky up on top and she was getting long enough that the rabbits were about to begin to like chow down and yank her off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Um, I chopped off the entire plant with a couple of inches of bare stem above the soil. And I sorted out, like I literally sat down and for about 40 minutes while watching the movie Gypsy with Natalie Wood, um, (laughs) I just untangled all of the vines and I cut them all into sections and I sorted them whether or not they had tubers or not. Any that didn't have a tuber went in water any that had tubers went into soil and then I unpotted the mother plant. I cleaned up the the tubers that were in the soil and the nursery planted her in like a really heavy peat based mix, which was way hmm. too water retentive and probably a contributing reason for why I rotted a bunch. Hmm. So I used a small clay pot so that the drainage and the drying would be really good. Yeah. And I filled it most of the way place the tubers on the surface and then put maybe like another half inch of soil on top of them. And I watered it and I've just kind of like left it growing. I actually added a grow light to that spot on my shelf just to like really encourage it along. And she's already springing back. There's no like vines yet, but there are new leaves and there are new stems growing. So do you enjoy growing these? Because I mean, from what I remember, I think you were pretty frustrated those first couple rounds. Right? Yeah, I was frustrated because I kept reading like this is such an easy plant and it's so beautiful. Like this is a plant that I really was surprised at how much I enjoyed it and also how much I wanted to make it work after I had my first failure because it's a very special specimen in my collection. I don't have anything else that looks like it. And I really wanted it to come together for me. So now that I've kind of figured out the recipe, I have three pots of them that are all from the same mother plant. Um, they're all pruned back cuttings at this point, basically. So it'll probably be summer before they look amazing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I love growing this plant. Okay, very cool. Okay, so Stephen, knowing that you are... Not a person who has ever found Careful these appealing. How you say that. Oh, uh, oh, oh, okay. W- okay, so I did find. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll let you finish. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I have had nothing but negativity from you on these, and not like burning negativity, but I feel like you look down on them because they're on everyone's Instagram page, and you can find out how to care about them online. Honestly, no, this is not one like that. I think I was watching you struggle with them a little bit, and I was like, whoa, these are kind of everywhere. I don't know if they're really worth that struggle, right? Yeah. When you're in your first you know, year or whatever. It turns out that the struggle was fake. I just needed to stop oh, watering it. The struggle was not real. Yeah. No, you know what? This one for me, I do like it, broadly speaking. And when it was new and sort of like, well, you know, quote unquote, new to me, right? I I was interested at first, I would say. And then it was just so hard to find that I was like kind of put off by that. Mm -hmm. But I think since then, for me, I think there are plants that are very similar that maybe are just a little bit more interesting in other ways. Name one. So I have two. Uh, you mentioned it, Hoya Courtesy Eye. Yes. I think that one to me is a is kind of a more interesting look. I like the fact that it would bloom like a Hoya, you know, flower instead. Yeah. You um, wouldn't mind that it's fragrant. Oh, I don't hate fragrance. Okay? <laughs> that is that is Matthew's invention. But I um. I think that one's more interesting. Uh-huh. That one's been on my list. I don't have that one. Also, I have an orchid that is a bit like String of Turtles. I think String of Turtles is kind of one that I'd be more interested in just the look oh, yeah. of. And and this is um, Pilea prostrata. Oh, the String of Turtles. Yeah. Yep. So I, I like that look a bit more. To me, the String of Hearts is a bit kind of ivy-esque, and we just see a lot of ivy hmm. around. Okay. I have an orchid called Trichosalpinx. 
That's I the, actually that's the love genus. this orchid. I think it's gorgeous. Yeah, and to me, it's it's not the same. The care is utterly different, but it gives me some of the same feel. It's like a trailing. It's almost like a miniature sort of string of turtles look. It actually looks a lot like string of turtles now that you say it. Yeah, it's kind of a jeweled, like, um, fleshy leaf. And I've had this for a couple years now. So I just feel like I kind of have my fix from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have other succulents, too, that I can kind of put a lot more neatly in different places than something that's going to be trailing. I mean, yeah. things like that. So it isn't any hard aversion, honestly, but it's just like, oh, well, I have things that feel, you know, fill this niche for me. And um, yeah, maybe I remember your struggle more than your triumph. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's been I'm more like, triumph oh, really than struggle. Wanna, <laughs> yeah. Like, do I really want to take this on or something? But yeah, there's a lot of really beautiful, I think, cultivars, like you've said, ones that I've not encountered in person, but just, you know, doing a little bit of research before I've seen online look yeah. great. Um, there's a lot of really cool, dense uh, plants that I've seen. And I kind of wonder how people get this. Like, is it just, you know, clumping a ton together i'm not even i'm sure sure it's that yeah like some of the ones that i've seen on instagram are like unbelievably full Mm. and long and thick so yeah that 25 year old plant i would definitely take i was trying to explain to brian so like brian used to do hairstyling as his profession and so when we watch tv and we see any woman on tv with long thick blonde hair he is like, that's all extensions. And he just kind of like points yeah. that out to me. And <laughs> yeah. now that I can like see that through his eyes, I showed him a picture of this plant and I'm like, this is my version of this is all extensions. So yeah, if you have a full a full string of hearts, that's all extensions. Yep. Okay, we know. Clip-ins. Right, that's it. Yeah. Um, but something that I do want to mention about this plant is that I notoriously don't like variegation. I do not have the variegated one. I have the straight species. What I love is patterned foliage. And the great thing that this plant offers is like kind of that silvery blue sheen that I feel like you really don't get in a lot of the the other trailing succulents on the market. And it's not something that you get in String of Turtles. It's not something that your String of Turtles-esque mm-hmm. orchid has. Yeah. Yeah, like this is a color palette that's fairly unique. They also tend to get like purple and pink depending on like their their heat or their sun or their cold so it's really a plant that can do a lot okay great yeah so you had one other tidbit for us right um yeah you wanted to throw in a bonus taxonomy yeah i'm just gonna call this like our taxonomy epilogue bonus Uh, bonus epilogue one of my favorite uh other plant podcasts is in defense of plants because it's really heavy hitting on like the botany nerd stuff that I get off on. So I found an article uh, that they published in 2018, and it's basically about how the genus Seriopegia, how the genus Seriopegia uh, kind of is getting really large. And this has to do with the fact that when taxonomists were first starting to assign plants into the nomenclature they were Mm -hmm. using morphology and they were using the morphology of the plant structures like the leaves and the stems the vines and especially the the flowers flowers, yeah yeah and it turns out that that's not the best way to do this because genetically very closely related plants might have extremely different like phenotypic expression but very distantly like appearing plants might be very closely related. And so because the Serapegia genus is distributed basically across like Africa, South Asia, Australia, these plants have developed into a lot of different habitats. So some of them have thick fleshy roots. Some of them have fibrous roots. Some of them have tubers. Some of them are upright shrubs. Some of them are trailing vines. Some of them are scrambling vines. There's so many different things about them that they're actually very closely related to all of the stapalia type plants. Yeah, it's a favorite of mine. Yeah. So stapalia, huernia, orbia, these are all like amazing members of Apanaceae that have giant, fleshy, furry, starfish-shaped flowers that reek of carrion. Some of them are nice. But uh, right. I'm gonna throw that too. Yeah, thank you for throwing that in. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but they're really amazing, and they're very, like, you can tell that they look like they are related. But it turns out that because the few species that they used to define those genuses as well as Serapegia, um 
they didn't use enough species to be able to clearly define what the genera were. So it turns out that they're actually like a lot more similar than anybody imagined. And genetically, they kind of belong in the same genus. So the next time that you're looking at your giant like Stapelia gigantica or something or your Huernia zebrina and then you're comparing it to your string of hearts, they're really closely related and we might see like one of those major taxonomy shakeups. I couldn't find anything to support in defense of plants in this claim. Really? Yeah, like... Oh, you know, I'm sure they're coming from somewhere there. Oh, yeah, yeah. like this dude is not making this up. But I don't think that it's become like caught on uh, knowledge the way that everybody freaked out when Rosemary was just put into the sage family recently. Okay. So this was not like published in nature yet. Yeah. I don't really know where it happens to be, but it's just very interesting to consider that there are members of Stapalia that really are a lot more like some of the Serapegia and -hmm. that there's a lot of Serapegia that you might mistake for a Stapalia. All right, so yeah, if you want to confuse people, just say Serapegia. Yeah, right? because you might actually be more it correct. It can mean anything. Yeah, now if you happen to be curious about what I'm talking about, you should go check out In Defense of Plants. On their website, they have this article. It's literally called The Genus Serapegia Recently Got a Whole Lot Bigger. And listen to their show too, it's really good. But just Google Serapegia species because this is a fantastically diverse genus. They have insane flowers that I'm not even going to begin to describe because it's going to sound like a jumbled alien mess. Yeah, there's a ton. So yeah. I've uh, found a few of these on Instagram like over the last years. Yeah. This has been one that I kind of lust after for a while. I don't know if I have the conditions for a lot of these, like et cetera, but... Yeah, I will share a couple in Instagram over the next week that I just love. They yeah. look alien. There's a lot that just look like these kind of green little twigs, like these gorgeous, gorgeous, vibrant little stars kind of all around them. So, yeah, yeah I am a huge fan. Some um, of them don't have leaves. Some of them have leaves that fall off real soon after they've grown. Um, the flowers might look like parachutes or umbrellas or fountains of wax. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with this plant. And if you want to get a good place to start, Serapegia woody eye. This is the one that is the easiest to grow. It is probably the most just generally visually appealing. Uh, it's going to behave really, really well on whatever bookcase you might put its pot. Right, and it should be easy to find. Yeah, I think that at this point you can find it real easy. If there's a specific cultivar that you want, you might have to go to eBay. You might have to go to Etsy. You might be paying a premium for some cuttings. But... I would say don't feel too terribly intimidated by cuttings because I think I've had a hundred percent success rate with the ones that I did while I was getting high watching Natalie Wood pretend to be Gypsy Rosalie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it yeah, it could even endure those harsh conditions. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Anything so, else you think people need to know about this plant? I think that's about it. Yeah. Uh, I think that people should go get it. So, as always, thank you for listening to Plant Daddy Podcast. We can be found on all the social medias at Plant Daddy Podcast. And we always take emails at plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com. You can also find our show notes and some other content, including responses to listener questions, on our website, plantdaddypodcast.com. And feel free to be in touch, reach out with any additional plant questions that you might have or plants that you might want to hear us mention in other uh, plant profile episodes. Thank you for listening and happy growing. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.